Praise the Lord. The Lord spoke to me to speak about the life of David and Solomon in the realm of conquering and wealth. Get ready to be blessed. Just about five minutes ago, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to do a, a message on probably a series on the lives of David and Solomon. People don't know about these guys. They think they know, but they're gonna, you're going to learn more about how to carry on in life if you want to be successful. Uh, I just was doing a series on revivalists, reformers, and revolutionaries. I did three volumes. I could squeeze more out today and get more, but of, of course I don't do that. I'll just jump on to the next thing. I covered that pretty well. I can get back to it. But the Lord said to me very clearly uh, when I took a walk that way, just about David. He said, speak about David and Solomon. Now, I'll, go, I'll share a few scriptures, but I won't read through right now all of them, but I'm going to just make reference to um, how, they, how they carried on and got where they got to. And there were reasons for that. Proverbs said, of course Solomon wrote that, the curse causes doesn't come. Without a cause, it doesn't come, but also the blessing without a cause doesn't come. Abraham didn't get rich either because he just was uh, fooling around with life. And, um, you know, sidestepping the, 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 the voice of God, what God said to do. He didn't do that. Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 8, from Moses' own writing, he said, listen to the voice of God and hearken to it and do it, and then you're going to get blessed. And the blessings of the Lord will overtake you, and you'll be the head and not the tail, the lender not to borrow, above only, not beneath. Bless when you go in, bless when you go out. Even the heathen will fear, fear you for the power of the covenant working in your life. And uh, we see that also in the life of uh, Isaac. Genesis 26, verses 10 to 14 in there. The Philistines were very jealous of him and scared of him. Even Jezebel, that idiot of a woman, one of the stupidest women that ever lived in God's green earth, she was afraid of Elijah, but she wouldn't say it. So why did she have to run after him, threatening him so much? Because she knew he had power. And he said, okay, I'll show you. And he sliced up the prophets of Baal, 850 of them. <laughs> and she heard about that, and then she really got mad, so she's going to kill him. He said, yeah. Let me tell you something, woman. The dogs will eat your flesh by the wall of Jezreel. And, they, and the scripture says they did. They left only her hands and her feet. So I'm going to get to David and Solomon, but I want to talk about the warriors in the Bible. A lot of people don't know about this stuff. They don't know. And the way we see things carrying on, let me tell you something right now. If you're going to play footsie with the devil and also with God's instructions, you know, like fool around with it, 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 the enemy's going to eat your lunch. I said this this week. I wish I could turn the clock back to early 2020 or 2019. Just do a lot more things than I did. We were always kicking against what oppression had come. But some things got so out of sorts, you know, it was hard. And you kind of, you I don't know, after a minute got used to not doing as much. I hate that. I'll say it again. I hate that. I'm, I'm infuriated by that. I, I don't think we ever should accept such a thing. I have a friend in America who's like my personal voice. And I'm not even going to say who it is. Maybe later I'll, you know, divulge the source. But this guy is on fire. This guy's plugged in. And I find his messages and I listen to it. It's like, it's like getting an injection. Now, let, me, let me tell you what I mean by that. It's like... Let me tell you the power of preaching, all right? Because a lot of people say, well, do you listen to God? More than you. Don't even try to ask me a question like that. You think God doesn't talk to me? I took a walk down past these tables over there to the end of this hall, and the Lord spoke to me audibly. He said, I want, you to, I want you to teach about David and Solomon. Did I just hear from God? Did God tell you that? Pipe down, everybody. But God preaches through men. Yes or yes? Uh-huh. So guess what? Is the Holy Ghost going to stand and preach like my wild evangelist friend in America? 
is she going to share all that? Is she going to shout and scream over the microphone? Is she going to play it through the internet? Is God going to stand there and do that? Or does he have a vessel of his do it? The power of preaching. The power of listening to the word of the Lord. Why did God anoint me to be his mouthpiece? For what? Because he could say it all himself? Did he want to? Does he do it? Somebody said, no man has seen God at any time. Even there's a scripture that says that. <laughs> no one has seen God. I've seen, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. So I don't know what that was talking about. Maybe, maybe talking about the Father's own face and countenance. No one's seen that. I, had, I got close uh, a few times, but I couldn't see it. He covered his face. But Jesus, I've seen his eyes, his face, his skin tone. His, I can tell you how he looks, what he was wearing, what he said to me in open visions. But the Father, you can't see him. So, yeah, no man has seen Jehovah, Father God, at any time. You know, and then the scripture says, you know, you'll know my disciples because you have love one toward another. So there's interaction with people, and God raises up voices and systems of things. And then, let's get to the real point here, the bigger point. He, he has the word of God that I have here on this table right here, this book, filled with things of what to do. Now, a pattern of conquest, of, of, of you being a warrior and taking reward, God will give you land. It's part of his covenant. Psalm 37 says, the, the righteous will inherit the land. Psalm 35, 27 said, the Psalm of David, the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Abraham had a lot of land, yes or yes? Solomon had a lot of stuff. Oh my God. David, how did he get it? How did Solomon become the way he became? Because of David, his father. And all these people, you better be careful where you go to church. I just heard another story, you know. My, my, one of my guys here just told me, you know, I went to this meeting and I feel, felt it didn't feel good. And I said, that's another church I don't go to. They call themselves a prophet. Mike Murdoch says, many people tell, say they're prophets to me and I don't believe them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel it. But Thomas Manton, he's a prophet unto the Lord. I believe in him. He's a real, he said, he said, you know, we have the video clips. He said it so many times. Dr. Mike Murdoch, the great general of wisdom. Dallas, Texas. So, God speaks through people. He speaks through his word. The stories in the Bible. Some people think they're just Bible stories. They don't apply to us. No, we got to get that kind of spirit. So David started out doing what? Preparing himself. He was out in the field doing his thing. Even his own father didn't believe in him. His stupid brothers didn't believe in him. Look at Joseph. What kind of brothers does he, did he have? They tried to kill him, you know. They sold him out for like the equivalent of $12 to Bedouin, uh, Bedouin group of people that were coming by and said, here, take this guy, do what you want with him, you know. <laughs> Lovely brothers, yeah. And then when Samuel came to anoint the next king, God said, go to Jesse's house. He went through all the six sons and said, I don't feel, no, I don't feel nothing. So what's up with that, you know? Jesse, mm. is there a son you have you're not telling me about? Jesse probably scratched his head and said, oh, no, it couldn't be David. Oh, go call David. The prophet's here. He, you know, he's getting annoyed now. Please, uh, let's not annoy the prophet. It's dangerous to do that. So um, <laughs> go get David. Let's see what happens. Sure enough, he poured oil on him, said, this is the Lord's anointed. Now, by the time he was, from the time he was anointed to the time he became king was 13 years. And first he became the, the, the king of um, Judea, I think it was, and then or Judah, and then whatever it was. And then he became the king of all Israel after that. But one feat that he did first, he saw an opportunity to take out the giant Goliath. So he kept asking, what happens to this one that kills this giant? And then he asked again. He said, tell me that one more time. I want to hear it again. He said he gets this and this and this and the king's daughter. I'm sure she was a beauty on the outside, but inside she was ugly. You know, Michal, she was nasty. The Lord didn't like her mocking David, so he struck her barren. So that's why David, you know, had problems because of that woman. 
You know, I could even look into that. Isn't that sad? Michal, the daughter of Saul, she should have been just good for him, and he had a nice family. Would have saved himself a lot of trouble. But then Bathsheba never would have been Solomon's mom. But look at what David went through because of Bathsheba. Sheba taking a bath. In the time when the kings went forth to battle, he stayed back and looked over and saw this naked woman there and said, oh my, oh my God, who's that? He told his guys, go and talk, go bring her up here. Ah, it was bad. And the husband found out, or was gonna find out, so he had him killed. What a tragedy, it shouldn't have happened. See, a nasty woman, that's why you gotta be careful who you're gonna connect with. Never connect with nobody that you don't admire God, and God doesn't admire. Forget it. Why are some of us still single yet? Well, because we look around and don't see, you know, what we need. Ah, my evangelist friend who's so anointed said this too. He said, he, was, he introduced his wife and said, uh, He introduced his wife and said uh, he really admires her and she helps him run the ministry. I'm like, wow. I look at her, I don't admire her that much. <laughs> I'm not saying names, so I'm not going to get in trouble. I look at her, I think, oh boy, she's not, she wouldn't be for me, but he likes her. They have a great marriage, great family life, great, you know, ministry. The ministry is so successful, it's beyond them. Uh, She's a firebrand. She is awesome. She's, she's a co-worker. You see, God said in the beginning, in Genesis 2.18, I'm going to give you someone that will help you, not hinder you. A completer, not a competitor, not a competitor. Not a hindrance. Not someone you want to say you're the chairman of the board. Not the B-O-A-R-D, but the B-O-R-E-D. You know, there should be some spark and some life and some passion and power. Relationships that help you succeed more. You need those in your world. Solomon had a lot of good people. Remember the Queen of Sheba came to see him in 1 Kings chapter 10. She heard the, heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord and the wisdom that he had and went to ask him many questions and brought traveled miles to bring a big offering of what people said was worth probably more than 4 or $5 million plus of stuff. Some people estimated... It could have been between like four and twenty million dollars worth of just to get an appointment. So they might have seen like, hey, there's somebody coming. Solomon could have said, I'm busy. But then he, said, he heard about all the stuff she was bringing and said, boy, this lady's very motivated, so let, let her come in. Let her come in and talk to me. And what she saw made her fall out. She fainted. She couldn't handle it. That was the glory of Solomon. Where did he get that from? Because he was himself? No, he got it from his father, David. David was a, a man that became very rich. I, I like something here in Psalm chapter 60 that I just felt. It's a, it's a miktam of David to the chief musician set to Lily of the Testimony, a miktam of David for teaching to the people then Look at that. And, and he fought against Mesopotamia and Syria of Zobah, and Joab returned and killed 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. <laughs> that's, just a, that's just the introduction in Psalm 60 in the New King James Bible. I mean, can you imagine? These were warriors. And David began to complain, says, oh, God, you've been displeased. Let me, cut, let me skip down because that's bad. Let me get on to something else. I want to talk about land here. So God has spoken in his holiness, verse 6. He said, I will rejoice. I'll divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is also is my helmet for my head. Judah is my law. Give him Moab, my washpot. Over Edom shall I cast my shoe. Philistia, shout in triumph because of me. The Lord was saying, who will bring me to the strong city? I guess this is David talking to with, in conversation. Who will lead me to Edom? If it's not you, O God, who casts us off, uh, then who can it be? And he said, you, 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 
you want to go out with our armies, you know, or you didn't go, or should you? David's asking these kind of questions. And at the end, he says, give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. There's another one, Psalm 60, verse 11. I used to have, and there's, there's also a reference to that in Psalm uh, 108. I used to have a problem with that, you know, thinking about saying the help of man is useless, because the help of man has, has been useful to me sometimes, a lot of times, I'm happy about it. But he knew that man couldn't get him into this next realm. And he said in verse 12, here it is. Through God we will do valiantly, for it is he who, who, who will shall tread down our enemies. It is God who will tread down our enemies. Do, do you see things like that? You look at these trash heaps of humans that are full of demons. <clears throat> I don't mean to speak about them disparagingly, but that's how I feel. You know, how are you? What's wrong with you? Look at you. You're a, you're, a, you're a disgrace to the human race, the way you're carrying on. We were pulling into the, into the driveway here outside the building, and uh, some psycho, was, the possessed, was standing in the road. He looked at me, and he started cursing and talking in another language. I'm like, you idiot, get out of the way. You know, you're lucky you don't get knocked down by the car. You know, thank God the driver's watching where they're going. You, you'd be... You'd be roadkill. What a, what a disgrace. Someone said, oh, let's have compassion on them. Listen, let me ordain you right now. Let me get the oil. Come here where I am. I'll lay my hands on you, or I'll just pour the oil on your head. So now you go and get those people and take care of them. Yeah, they need help. Too much help. But are, are, they, are they a help or a hindrance? You can't even drive. They're standing in the middle of the driveway. Completely out of their mind. So what are you going to do with somebody like that? Now, I know what I'm talking about from lifelong experience. I had a guy one time, a religious old man in, uh, in America. The Lord is a warrior. How do I know that? Exodus 15, verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord of hosts is his name. Man of war in Hebrew is Sabaoth. S-A-B-B-A-O-T-H, S-A-B-B-A-O-T-H, which means he's the Lord God of the armies. People walk around these days, they've been, they've been taught in watered down, secret sensitive, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, religious churches and they think, oh, Christianity means to be nice, you know, help the, like, and, then, and people in the world mock people, oh, they're the walking wounded, they, they need the crutch of like a Bible or something to, because they need help. People in the world are like, I'm successful, I'm going after it. Why aren't you in the church even more than them? I know a woman of God who invited me to preach in her, 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 her little conference, and I couldn't get there. I tried to go, but I was too busy. I just couldn't do it, and I, I really wanted to, you know? And I told her that when I saw her. I, I hope she believed me, but it was true. I, I said, boy, I, I, dear, I was really trying to come, but I just, it was impossible. I really wanted to come by. So she told a story, and this is what she said. She said a Christian guy uh, hired her and treat, treated her so bad and then she got hired by people from the other religion and they treated them so well, her so well. How's that for a statement for the church? I got somebody right now from Saudi Arabia who was talking to one of my assistants in America and uh, they, we have a big project we want to do and they're talking to them to see if they'll help. So the first, my first question was how much money do they have? Do they really have money or are they just talking? Can you discern if they really have money? Are they, are they okay? And I was reminded that Cref, uh, uh, Creflo was talking about getting a jet and everybody in the church was like hemming and hawing and mocking him and persecuting and cursing at him and accusing him of every kind of thing. And some guy in the Middle East, an oil man, said, uh, what's up with you people, you church people, you're giving the man such a hard time. He's a good man. So this, this was years ago, okay, now, I don't know, Creflo, now, I don't know, I don't know, hey, 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 anyway, moving right along, but back in the day, back then, he was on it, he was still on before he got into this other gospel, or grace, or whatever you want to call it, I don't even, I don't understand it, I'm not listening, I'm not listening, I'm, I'm not trying to hear that, talk to the hand. So uh, 
Why? Because I don't need it. I'm saved. You know, my life. I'm trying to just walk in the realm of obedience to God and be successful. What do I need to think about the the grace versus the law? Is that a teaching for me? Do I care what it says about all of that stuff? You know, grace, grace, grace. Well, hey, to me, grace is what it says in the Book of Acts. I like the scripture in the Book of Acts when it says the grace of God was upon them all, which means it was the power of the Holy Ghost was upon them all to help them do more advance the kingdom and to evangelize and get out there and produce signs and wonders and miracles and really advance the whole thing. That, that, to me, that's the grace of God. I like the word, the letter G, right? Like the big thumb and then the four fingers, R-A-S-R-A-C-E, uh, race. God on the race, the grace of God, G, race. My race, God on my race by his empowerment. To me, that's what grace is. And of course, I, I'm backed up by, in, uh, is it Acts chapter 4 or whatever, wherever it is, says the grace of God was strong upon them all. That wasn't a, a positional, doctrinal discussion. It was power of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Let's just get that straight, okay? From, from, the, from Scripture, what it was. So this, uh, this oil man, this Shiko, whoever he was, Rich in oil, he said, you know what? Uh, he got annoyed. He said, how much is the jet? Uh, $65 million. Okay. And he bought it for him and sent it to him. He said, tell all those Christians to take back their money, you know, if they want to. I have an apostle friend that said, no, I don't want to do that. No, let me, let me leave that alone. Dealing with the same uh, gentleman, the same man of God. Saying, well, he, he believed that before and he was working and all that. Well, should he refund the people? You know, you, there are people that get into that. I, I don't want to go into that. Other people have said that. I want to leave that alone. But I like that story about one guy who's not of our faith. Just said, oh, it's just a jet. Give the man his jet. He needs it. No problem. Case closed. So the church has been duped, sold a lot of a lot of lies and a lot of uh, watered down nonsense and weakness and all that. You're walking around like victims. You know, some, some and maybe they mean well, some, some speakers would come into a meeting, they might say, okay, they come and look at the church, and, uh, how many need a breakthrough? And everybody lifts their hand. Well, how many really need a really, really breakthrough? And everybody, put up your other hand, and everybody puts up their hands. How, how many need to be healed? Oh, God. How many really need the healing? Oh, yeah. Now, if you need to be healed, get healed. Let's get healed. I'm for that. But people shouldn't automatically be walking around needing a breakthrough. I am breakthrough. I carry breakthrough. But what? Which God are we serving? He's the God of the breakthrough. Are we broken through? If he's with us, we, we have the breakthrough. That doesn't mean you don't go through some things along the way. But God can fix them. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, it also said, the psalmist said, I think it was the 34th psalm, right? Somewhere in there. 24 to 34, I can't remember, I think it was 34. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Though a righteous man stumble even seven times, he keeps going to the eighth time and forever. So you can't take things sitting down. It doesn't matter what came your way, you've got to get back up and keep going. I said this last night, what did Winston Churchill say? Never, never, never give up. Never, never, never give up. Never, never, never give up. And he didn't, and they won. They whipped the Germans, the Nazis, and put them out of business in April or May in 1945. And it was all over. But before that happened, the tragedy, they killed 50 million people in Europe. 50, 50, 50 million people died on the European continent. Six million plus Jews, of course, in the Holocaust. I, I watched all the Holocaust documentaries last year. You know, I just got into it for a, a, a few weeks and I watched them all and I really wanted to learn more about hearing those people's testimony. I listened to all of them. I probably listened to 20 or 30 of them. And they were all two hours plus. The old people, old ladies, the ladies were the best. The men were okay, but the ladies, ladies are details. You know, they can tell more details than they remember. More details, every little detail. I wanted to hear all of it. The horrific things that the Nazis, oh my, what they did to people. Oh. But Adolf got put out of business, didn't he? Stalin finally got put out of business. 
Pol Pot in Cambodia got put out of business, didn't he? That stupid old devil of a man. Idi Amin got put out of business, didn't he? Died of cancer. He didn't get saved because he was shouting the name of the other guy. Saddam Hussein. What happened to him? He was saying the name of the other guy. I was like, oh, you shouldn't have done that, son. Wrong, wrong prayer. He's like, blah, 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 calling the guy's name. You know the other name. And then, blah, 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 blah. bro. You, you screwed up. Can you imagine at the end if you would have went, Jesus, 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 please, please, please. You know, maybe the guy could have, could have been different. So the end of every debaucherous, maniacal, murderous, filthy, evil thing on the, in the earth has an has a end, of, a end of the matter of destruction. And so does every enemy of yours and every enemy of mine. Their end is death and destruction. It's not, uh, it's not good. Psalm 41, 11, again from the psalm, psalmist, said, those that strive with you will perish. So you can't strive with a servant of God. You can't mess with the church. You can't mess with David's covenant or Solomon's covenant. One thing God did that was so amazing was he didn't wait for Solomon to wake up after the thousand burnt animals offering. He didn't wait for him to wake up. Solomon was so tired, he probably felt like he's almost in a coma when he went to sleep. You know, like dead asleep, exhausted, tired, many dead. Can you imagine many, a thousand animals killing them and roasting them and the whole thing and the ceremony and the music and the whatever they were doing. How many, how, how many hours, how many days did it go on for? And then when he finished that, he went to lay down. He was gone. The Lord didn't even wait till the next day till he walk, woke up and walked around to talk to him. He visited him immediate, He visited Solomon immediately in his sleep. and said, now you've done this for me. What do you want? And Solomon conversed with him in the spirit in his dream. Can you imagine that? Solomon was not awake. He was asleep. Did God wait for Abraham to, to walk into another season of, of, of years ahead to make the covenant with him like he did in Genesis 15? No, he did it right there. Did he wait for Adam to have to try to pray and figure out what he would need? No, he put him to sleep and, and took his rib out and made a woman for him. And he woke up and he looked at her and went, whoa, man. I guess that was her name then. Whoa, man, whoa, man. Look at you. Thank you, Jesus. He might not have said Jesus, but he probably, you know, he was talking to the boss. Thank you, Lord. And Solomon needed inspiration, so he had a thousand women. That was a mistake, though. David needed inspiration but he went a different way for a while but he kept coming back and then what did God do did God tell him ah you're off you met you missed my will eh? forget about you no look at how much is written from the life of David you have all of first and second Samuel come on and then you have all of the Psalms 151 Psalms and then the, the talk of the lineage of David, even Rahab, you know, and then all, all the way down to, uh, to, to being the, the ancestor of Jesus, son of David, people called Jesus. Can you imagine this David? What did he do? His passionate heart broke him past every barrier and he got connected. So he took out Goliath. He got the reward. He began to walk toward it. And God, God chose him as king and sent the prophet to anoint him in Jesse's father's house. It happened. Now he went on the other thing. He had a fight with Saul now. Saul, jealous Saul. He had to go through that whole scenario, you know? And then look at later on. Now he becomes king. And look at what, what he did. 
And he kept, he, he was so violent that God said, you know, I don't want you to build my temple because of the blood on your hands. So David said, yeah, you don't want me to do it? I wanted to do it, so guess what? I'll pay for it. And let me go shed some more blood. You call me a bloody man, let me go, let me go do some more so I can gain more spoils and we can build it anyway. And then God decided to say, I, I'll choose Solomon to do it. David funded it. You think Solomon just went out and became a multi-billionaire, even a trillionaire? You know, someone said he's, he was dancing around with about two and a half trillion dollars or more worth of stuff. Solomon. You think he got that all on his own because he had a dream to be a businessman? No. He got it from David. So what are we getting from David? You say, well, that was thousands of years ago. What am, how am I going to do it now? David's not around. Yeah, but he's... He, <laughs> He's right. Guess what, folks? This is a startling revelation. He's right here. Here he is. Here's David. See, but here's what happened in the church, especially in Africa, but some African places, not maybe Nigeria, because Nigeria, I know a lot of Nigerians just love the word, they respect the word, and I know some, a few Kenyans that say they do, but I still don't believe them. Bunch of, bunch of whatever. Let me not say any decorative terminology if you love the word you know if you understand that the word is power first someone has to teach it to you you know I should tell you like hey you need this read this here lead me to the rock that's higher than I higher than I when my heart is overwhelmed yeah you're a shelter for me a strong tower from the enemy that's Psalm 61 and then just go like this Lord I take it for myself. Can you do that? Absolutely. Is this for you? Absolutely. Some, some people be like, wow, you know, thanks, Doc. I never thought of that. No one told me that. Whatever, today's Sunday afternoon. It's going to Sunday evening now. No, whatever church you were at today, if you were at a church, did the pastor tell you that? I'd like to go in there and take him by the neck and throw him out in the road. Baptize him with his chai tea. He said, here, go clean your suit. And get, a, get out of here, you, you, you buffoon. Acting like you're preaching, making noise. To do what? You're there to take money for yourself? Oh, oh look, I, I see something. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, like the name. Uh, here's a name. Oh, yeah, yeah. Take your name and stick it where the sun don't shine. We don't, nobody needs to know their name, all right? I'm not trying to, if God will talk to me sometimes and tell me names of people, but I really got away from it. I really didn't care. It didn't grab me too much. A few times that it happened, I was kind of amazed, you know? Someone that, I, I tell them their name, I tell them some details, and they're all crying. Woo, people seem to love that. But to me, here's, here's my thinking mind, you know? God made, gave me a brilliant mind. I thought, I, he's giving me a brilliant mind. I thought, don't you know your name? Someone's crying and saying, oh, the prophet told me I was raised by my grandmother. How did he know that? You, what's wrong with you? Is that like information that's going to help you succeed in life? You didn't know that? You need someone to tell you that? Are you insane? Are you insane? Are you jacked up in the head? What is wrong with people? This one guy has a big ministry. Oh, my God. Let me leave him alone because, you know, to me, if the Holy Ghost is doing something, I can't argue with it. But, you know, he always says his name. My name is, and he says his name. What's wrong with you? Is that God? That you have to announce your name to people, and everybody goes, ha, ah, thousands of people are there. Because you could tell someone what they did, and this person over there, and this guy, this is where he went, and this is the name of the place. And everybody's like, and he even has a, some annoying lady voiceover announcer on the program. I tried to watch it. I got so infuriated. I wanted to break the television. I said, I, 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 my blood pressure, please, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't take this. So I go to the prophet, you know, he says these things. And then, and then the other ones go, go deeper, prophesy, prophesy. Let me catch one guy in my meeting ever taking a microphone and screaming, prophesy. I will take that mic from him, knock him in the head and say, sit down, son. If I ever hear your voice again, I'm going to put you out of here. Sit down. T turn that microphone off. I don't need you to tell me to prophesy. 
I had some guy the other day telling me to drink my coffee and eat the food they put on the table. I looked at him like, am I a child? Get out of my face. This, this pastor guy. I never, I never liked him and he reappeared somewhere. So I had, to, I had to endure it. I, I remember that guy from before, I never liked him. He's, tell, he's talking to me like, what am I, what am I, Joe? Am I a child, you have to tell me? I can have it if I want. I didn't say a word, I just looked at him, you know. Wisdom is knowing when to talk and when not to talk. A lot of times you just have to be quiet and endure. Like today we were somewhere, right? Did I go up and talk to those people in their language? Did I do that? No. Ni hao, ma ma, ika ma ya, unja. No. Or did I tell the lady, hey lady, what's wrong with you? No, you just don't say anything. You just stay invisible, stay invisible. What did Bruce Lee say, the famous, you know, the great uh, martial arts guy? He said, you got to be like water, just flow. You'd be like invisible. You know who a great usher is or a great servant is? Someone that doesn't get noticed. You know who a great worker is and a skilled person? They could be doing their function and, and they don't irritate you in any way. Their presence is like... It's subdued, it's almost like robotic. You know, like, they just can do things that perform, like, without, there's no, like, grinding gears or bad vibes, it's just all smooth. That's a great life. That's a great life to have an environment like that, where you just feel happy, you feel at peace, everything is good, everything is flowing. Just like, you just move and everything works. We need to have skill like that in every area, you know, in every area of life. Now, I gotta say one thing. David was wise, yes? So, well, you know, Solomon maybe, maybe God had to give Solomon the mantle of wisdom he gave him. Maybe he put a, more on him than he put on David. But uh, wisdom is powerful. Wisdom is to like see a situation and instantly you know what to do. You have the gift of wisdom. Wisdom is a principal thing. I love Proverbs 4 when Solomon said, here, see like when he was writing Ecclesiastes, he was a little bit jacked up. When he was writing Song of Solomon, he was in a, you know, a kind of a different kind of thing. But then when he got to writing the Proverbs, boy, he was like, hear, hear me, my son, and receive the instruction of a father, for I give you good doctrine. Don't forsake my law. Take it to your heart and, and work with it. And he said, Get wisdom and with it, get understanding. Wisdom and understanding is so powerful. David had a lot of it. Solomon had more. Wisdom is a principal thing. I love what wisdom says. I, wisdom, deal with all prudence, meaning to know what to do in every situation. And wisdom... Uh, was likened to like a she, like a woman. Can you imagine? In the feminine uh, per personage of, of description. And, uh, and said, I was with the Lord in the beginning. Wow. And I know everything. It says, receive me. The scripture says, receive her. Receive wisdom and uh, your life will be become like an ornament of grace, of beauty and riches and wealth, favor and riches and wealth. Wisdom builds wealth. When you know what to do and you know how to flow, you'll, you'll become successful. Let me tell you what the world can't ever argue with, no matter if they like you or not, is, is success. No matter who likes you or doesn't like you, when you're successful, you're on top, you have it, and they'll chase after you. And then by the time they do, you'll be like, huh, where were you before? <laughs> where were you back then? Some, someone write, they write these memes on the internet these days, which are a little bit uh, cheeky, you know? Like, uh, if, if you want to see me later when I'm successful, I could say to you, like, where were you when I was on my way up? You didn't want to know me then, right? Which is kind of half, it's kind of half-witted. I mean, you, you don't have to think like that. Just live your life and be successful and do what you want. Let who loves it, love it. Let who doesn't love it. Don't, who cares? When you got it, you got it.
David ran into a serious problem when the enemy attacked him at Ziglag. And what did he do? He cried for a while, but then he rose up in anger to say, Lord, now what, what's up with this? Let me, let me approach God. And he said, Lord, should I rise up and pursue them? Should I go after them and overtake them? Should I reclaim and get back and take back and recover all? And the Lord says, yeah, thou, thou has, you have well said, my son, go and do it. I'm with you. That's what he did. So this kind of realm of that, that nature of the warrior needs to be in us, that we don't take any, any garbage off the devil. And whatever manipulation and oppression tries to come, you don't take it. David had that nature. Solomon certainly had that nature. Now in 1 Kings chapter 9, around the 14th or 15th verse, I'm not going to turn there now, there's a story of when Solomon gave a decree to go get some gold, and he told Hiram, one of his managers, who was also a great leader, but Hiram gave instruction to the men who were the seamen who knew how to work with the ships going to, you know, moving. And Solomon, this is what I love, Solomon's servants, you can read it in 1 Kings chapter 9, let's say 12 to 16, somewhere in, in, in that middle part of it. And the servants of Solomon were there, and they knew what to do and carried it out. When was the last time you went on a mission to buy 420 talents of gold, which was probably a billion dollars plus? First Kings 10, verse 3, the, sub, the subtitle of the, of, the, of the verse says, 3.83 billion U.S. dollars worth of gold was laid at Solomon's feet in one year's time. What are we doing? Abraham, did he have land? Moses, did he have land? All of it. He went through something on the way to uh, uh, becoming uh, manifested in bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, but they went out with all the wealth. Does God want you wealthy? Some people don't know that. They really don't know that. No one's ever taught them that. Or they want to they wanna listen to the devil at the gate. Oh, the prosperity gospel, that's another thing. You ever see people like that? They have nothing. You look at them and you think, well, why wouldn't you like prosperity? My friend Mike Murdoch, Dr. Mike Murdoch, he says, if you're going to doubt anything in the Bible, doubt the hell part. But don't doubt the money part. If you want to question anything or not like something, dislike the hell part, but don't dislike the blessing part. You shouldn't, you shouldn't dislike or doubt any of it because it's all true. But God is, God is a blessing God. He's a business-minded person. He wants everybody to be wealthy. Do you believe that? And, but peop, people can't because they can't catch it. You say, well, if God wanted everybody to be a millionaire, wouldn't they be? No, they can't because they don't choose to. Well, God is sovereign. I believe, you know, he can do anything. Sure. If he wanted you to like arrange your clothes in your house in the morning or last week, he'd come, he'd come to your house and do it for you. God does what we do. We do what he shows and then he does what we do. There's a scripture that proves that. It says, to the pure I show myself pure. To the profane I show myself profane. To the crooked I'll even show myself crooked. Remember one time he did something crazy in the, in the prophets. He, he put a lying spirit in these prophets. The Lord, it says the Lord did it. The Lord did it. Put a lying spirit in the mouth of some prophets then because they, people wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. And God says, you want to hear that and not me? Okay, I'll let a deception come. There it is, take it. I'm going to play with God. God. God was probably really annoyed. Does God ever get annoyed? Yeah, like what about Noah? He told Noah to build an ark. In a hundred years, it took him to build it, and, and God never changed his mind. You think he'd cool down after a hundred years? You, you think he'd relax after a hundred years? Can you imagine the Lord is watching Noah build an ark for a hundred years? And after the hundred years, he still floods the earth and kills everybody. This is someone you do not want to fool around with. 
because he didn't see the change in man. He said he repented that he made man because of how wicked they came, became. He said he saved eight people alive, Noah and his immediate family and all the animals. Boy, that was a fiasco. Can you imagine all the animals being on this boat, sailing over the top? Someone said, oh, that's a Bible fable story. Oh, the Manoah's Ark, oh yeah. But do you believe the word? It's, it's in here, this is where it came from. The same God that talked about Noah's Ark talks about how he's gonna protect us here in the Psalms, and how he's gonna bless us. And then Psalm 35, 27, that he takes pleasure in my prosperity. And 3 John 2, when John said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. The same God that talked about this, the gold and treasure that Solomon got. But some of might say, well, why doesn't everybody have it? Or why don't I have it yet? You have to fight for it and keep going and never give up. Never, never, never give up. Never quit. There's no other plan. You can't, you know, if you quit, <laughs> if you quit in the process, you got to get in the back of the line if you want to get involved in the game again. Don't quit. I never quit. I like Lester Summerall wrote a book, The, Apost the Great Apostle of uh, Power. Oh, that guy. I spent a lot of time with him. He was a great man of God. He died in 1996. I had the privilege of being in many cities with him, had dinner with him. I sat on his private jet, which he affectionately named Angel Four. His jet. His pilots were so nice to me. I sat right at Lester Summerall's seat, when he's the seat he used to sit in. Can you imagine they, they had me, asked me to sit there. I received an impartation, I really did. He laid his hands on me and then finally, one day he said, goodbye Earth, I'm leaving. And he wasn't kidding, a few months later he checked out. April of 1996. It's quite a long time ago, isn't it? 06, 16, Shabbat, it's 26 years ago. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I'm a young man, yeah? So let's someone wrote a book, said, I did not quit. And then he said, I did not quit. I will not quit, ever. And he went through things and he had to go to God. God, you see this, how it is here? And the Lord said to him, the Lord said something really funny to him. He said, just be faithful, son. Keep at it. It'll work out. <laughs> Can you imagine you're going through hell and the Lord just tells you something like that? <laughs> Treasures and wealth. I speak it. The life of David and the life of Solomon. Get into it. Read about it. Pray. Talk to God and say, I, I, I'm going to live like that. You know, I've done that over the years, and I'm doing it again now. And, and, and uh, today, uh, well, something happened uh, this morning, early afternoon, that was just beyond imagination. Beyond, beyond. You don't know. I'm not going to tell you either. But it's beyond, beyond. For me, Thomas Manton the fourth God's servant. Like David of old, like Solomon of old, we're rich. Like Abraham of old, we're rich. Like Job, God blessed double for his trouble, we're rich. Isaiah 60 also said for your shame, 61, for your shame you'll have double. Arise and shine. Keep arising and keep shining. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The gross stockings covers the earth. My light shall be seen upon you. And kings will come to the brightness of your rising. And then what happens? The forces of the Gentiles will come with them. Do you believe that? Can you believe like that? I do. I think about it all day, every day. I mean, I think about other things. I don't just stay in one position of thought, but it's like it's always alive in me. Part of God's covenant is for you to have land. I prophesy you're going to own land. I don't know where and how much, but you're going to... You ha it, it's the covenant of God. You have to get over. You have to cross over into that realm. You have to cross over into a realm of having a lot of money, not just a little money. You have to cross over into a realm you have everything good, not just a few things that are good. That's part of the covenant. But a lot of people don't teach on that. 
That's why I started raising my voice a while ago. I mean, I, it just is it infuriating that now, now maybe they're the blind lead, maybe they were the blind following the blind, they all fell in the ditch and they're the ones that were in the back of the line there, following another blind guide, you know. That's sad. So I'm confident at whatever level the audience is at, and these uh, socials are already, uh, they're so persecutory against the anointing. But the day is coming soon when we'll be on satellite television all over the planet. And I'll have a whole teams of people answering the phones because I'm not going to answer all those calls. I can't. In fact, the Lord told me to disappear and become inaccessible to a lot of situations. Dad, I'm going to do it. Because I can't do everything, you know. There's some things that the machine has to run and the organization has to run. And we want to care for everybody. My books will go digital around the world. All of the writings, all the messages, yeah. But I'm confident in this, that as I'm speaking by the Holy Ghost, in the realm of the Spirit, the messages are going out. And sometimes I'll be complaining to God, you know, a little bit thinking like, well, what's going on? You know, the Lord spoke to me the uh, day before yesterday. Yesterday was Saturday, or Friday. <sighs> was it Friday or Saturday? I don't think it was yesterday. I think it was the day before. And I was in the middle of that little series of revolutionaries, uh, revivalist revolution, uh, reformers and revolutionaries. Three parts. I did it on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So uh, uh, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, I did three, three volumes on that. And that will become a book and all that. But uh, and the Lord said, to ask the people, will you be one of those for me? I said, yeah, I got the title. This is great. So the Lord spoke to me and said, son, the fact, my son Thomas, because you've been speaking, I've had you say this so many times. How many have heard me say that more than you can count about how people need to teach the word. Preachers need to teach the Bible. How many times have I said that? You can't count. You lost count, right? And the Lord just jabbed me and said, you think I had you say that for nothing? You think it's not going to happen? So next phase, I'm going to hear about it happening. And I'm going to see people getting raised up. And they're going to have testimonies of blessing and breakthrough. Not because of some prophet who says he's prophesying. Jesus. I, I, I went to a meeting and of course they, uh, I'm, I'm respected, so they wanted me to close the meeting out. So this great apostle from America was there and he left the dash to go pray for someone. I thought, I don't want to go pray for somebody. That's your job. I'm going back to the hotel. We're in this church. We'll meet you later. We'll meet you at the hotel. He's like, oh, I got to go pray for, I promise I'm going to go pray for someone. They had to drive somewhere to pray for someone. I said, Help, bro, you go do that. Uh, so I had the car take us to go back to the hotel. Then he came, we had lunch. And the guy, the pastor, prophet, seemed like such a nice guy. And they said, we want you to come back and do like a week revival. I said, well, thank you for the invite. Let's see what the Lord, you know, what the Lord said. The Lord never gave me any inspiration about it. And I wondered about that. Then I'm in America in a great conference, and, and he shows up there with his wife. And his son is uh, working in that, in that huge ministry, uh, his own son. So he came to see him and be in the conference. And then I was there. So I see him. And I'm like, wow, look at this. You're here. So we go to lunch. And we're at lunch at the Cheesecake Factory. You know, he tells, he tells me the whole story about this guy, how he treated him, how he mistreated him, what he did. The dirtiest stuff you could imagine. A prophet in the city of Nairobi. Prophet with a big church on the road, with a big sign. Can you believe it? I looked at him and I was like, nah, that guy did what? I said, thanks for the intel, boss. If I told the things that he told me, you'd be like shocked. 
and this is supposedly a prominent preacher, who has a very nice uh, demeanor. He's, he has a really nice smile. He looks like a light, he just looks like a guy you want to hug, you know, like one of them, you know, happy, nice kind of guys, you know, cool guy. He, that's like, he has that appearance. And I thought, he told him, he lied, he undermined him, he tried to mess him up, he stole, he did this, he, lied, he told lies about all I was like, I almost wanted to say, stop talking, don't tell me anymore. <laughs> I can't take it. Then another, another pastor that I knew, who, I, who was quite gifted, but uh, and he, he fell into some real decline, and I, I kind of wondered why. And then one of his key people told me all the things that he was doing. I was like, no, please don't tell me that, please. Please, this is too bad. It's shocking. So what does God need? He needs people filled with his glory, real revivalists, real reformers, real revolutionaries. Were David and Solomon that? Yeah. Was Abraham that? Yeah. Let's just stick with the Bible. Forget about men. Forget about who's who. Forget about where you are. Get into the biblical reality of things. You can do that. You can do it in your house. You can get your Bible and read it. You can listen to messages by the generals that have even gone on to heaven before. They're, they're still playing on the internet. Find stuff that you could feed yourself and acclimate to the higher level. And the Lord said to me, now, uh, I, I'm saying a lot of things from the scripture and telling a lot of uh, details of it. But really, the real point of this is right now, the Lord said, I want people to walk like David walked. I want people to live like Solomon lived. I do. But can they, can they catch it? To catch it, you know how much you have to fight through and get through? But it's still possible. Let's lift our hands and say, Lord, please touch my life. My life has to be that kind of place of treasure and wealth and blessing. It has to happen. Too much time has gone by already. It's terrible. It's tragic how much time has been lost. It has to happen. Can God do it? Yeah. Can God heal you of any problem you have? Of course he can. There's no, there's no problem Jesus can't heal. There's no problem that more of the Holy Ghost can't take care of. There's no issue that you have that more of the blessing of God can't fix. But how are we going to get it? By prayer and study of the word. Ezra 7.10, I love it. Ezra, who in the beginning of the thing went on this tirade about saying he felt like he wasn't even a prophet, but of course he was. You know, he said, I was no prophet, and my, my household, my father, you know, we, we were not from that stuff. We didn't know. But he caught a burden. And I was saying this the other night. I didn't just catch a burden. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me in an open vision, laid his hands on me, and, and, and released a fire into me and said, My son Thomas, I, am, I have ordained you. I'm commissioning you to be my prophet to the nations. So I can't say I caught a burden, like Ezra said. I can't say that. I was ordained into this office by the head of the church himself in an open vision in New York City many, many years ago. The roof disappeared, the house disappeared, the walls disappeared. I'm standing in a heavenly place. I was sitting, on, on, uh, I was sitting in one room and, and, and everything disappeared and the Lord stood in front of me. And I think I stood up but then I knelt down and he laid his hands on my head and released a fire into me. It's never, it's never stopped burning from that day until now. And it never will. It's an eternal thing. So I can't say I caught a burden, but uh, Ezra caught a burden. Now in 7.10 he said, the scripture says the word of God was rare in those days. I think we're in that day right now. The word of God was rare in those days. Like the revelation of truth was rare. Rarely taught about, rarely talked about. Rarely talked about, rarely taught, rarely, rarely, rarely demonstrated. So Ezra said, what am I going to do? He said, I'm going to study, and I'm going, to, I'm going to apply it to my life, and then I'm going to teach it to others. And he became a phenomenon in his day. A teaching priest, the Bible called him. Do we need teaching priests today more than anything else? We don't need another person to say they're a prophet, to say that they're going to give someone some information to tantalize people so, you know, 
Uh, one guy was telling me this week, a pastor was telling me, some guy came to his church. He, he was a Kikuyu guy from uh, Kiambu or something. I don't know where he was from. And uh, I asked him his name. He said his name. I had never heard of the guy. And I guess he's disappeared now. He said he was going around telling people that, I want to give you a prophecy, but you have to send me 80,000 or whatever. By M Pesa. You know, send me 80,000 and by M Pesa, and I'll, I'll, pro I'll prophesy to you. And, 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 you know, some poor people there, you know, they went to borrow money to send it to him to get a prophecy. I was like, what kind of prophecy was that? I'd like to follow up their life and see if anything really happened. The first thing, they should have had their 80,000 back in the first week, you know? And then profit after that, if it was really of God. So the guy was telling me the story, you know. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the church world. But who's teaching the Bible? Where's the teaching priest? If people would sit around someone that's bringing the word and catch a hold of it, you can't stay the same. And then just the doctrine of prosperity and financial blessing alone is all laced through every chapter of every book. The Bible, through 40 authors over 1,500 years, inspired by the Holy Ghost, about 865,000 words. In all kinds of time frames and settings and situations and the logos word came forth. And that's what we have to partake of. But who's doing that? I wonder sometimes if there's a disconnect and this is a real sad thing and we need the Holy Ghost to break this. People can read the scripture or hear it but they don't Apply it to themselves. You know, this is the assignment God gave me in this message. This is just what, I'm going to tell you just what he said, and I think we're going to come in for a landing. This is what he said. I, I want to keep it simple, all right? I'm sharing a lot of things, with, which are great things to say and teach, and I'm, I know you're learning from this. But he said to me, I want you to preach, up, I want to teach about, Sol, about David and Solomon because I want people to catch that fire and live like that. Wow. That's what he said. If the Lord just said to me, I want you to teach you about the life of David and the life of Solomon, would I say yes? Of course I would. Would I do it? Yes, of course. And I know a lot from memory, obviously. I know a lot I could read through the scripture. But, but for what purpose? He told me the purpose of it. See, one thing about me that I enjoy, God enjoys, and I enjoy, because it's, it's, I feel good about it, that it happens. I don't just like to tell you what, I like to tell you how. And also why. And what. And then you need to know where to do something, with who. The five W's, what, when, where, who, and why. You should know why you want to do anything, but now you need to know what to do and with who. And then when to do it and where to do it. <laughs> if you get into the right place at the right time with the right people flowing, you can't lose. Let's lift our hands and pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Everybody, Karen, Dele, Soratala, Varaterebe. Father, I prophesy a disconnect from every wrong person, everything that's clouded our way, anything that's affected us adversely, any person, any environment, any situation, any place we might find ourselves in. What, whatever is causing the hindrance to the heavy flow of glory, of wealth and business and success and empowerment and the high life, high living, the high road, the exact perfect will of God, everything that the Lord wants to do, Lift your hands again. Sorry for the interruption. Anything that's blocking the, blocking the flow, let it be removed. Anybody that's a hindrance to us, take them away from us. People that we need to connect with that are a blessing, a blessing flow, a blessing factory of so many things, let us be with them. Even if it feels like uncomfortable to go reach for somebody. No, we have to. Because if we don't, what are we going to get? There are people that are divine connections that we've, we've, we've discovered of late uh, in, in recent days. So we need to do more with them and less with others. And then if people had an agenda, one agenda or another agenda, so you just see how, how spiritually void that is. Well, just leave it there. No problem. And don't get mad about it. Just shift gears. 
just shift. There's somebody in this town, there's somebody in this area, there's someone within reach that's brilliant, that's helpful. That's a divine connection where there's favor and things can begin to happen. Those are the connections you need to be working with. And, stop, and also stop trying to uh, tolerate deadness or, or drag people along that really are just a, a, a heavy weight to you instead of a, a push to get you to your destiny. I was reading that about Solomon, how he told Hiram to tell these other guys to go and get the big treasure uh, uh, of gold, of 420 talents of gold, and bring it to him. And it just all worked so perfectly. I thought, what kind of level of life is that? The people in the average place, do they live like that? Do they walk like that? Do they work like that? Have they ever experienced anything like that? No, but there are people that have the resources. I have divine connections, you know, that I've been working with, and, and these people are great. And so much is happening. But it doesn't happen through everybody. So wisdom is to know who's what and what's who and what you need to do and to know the difference between it all and then to make the decision to just do the right, most expedient, most profitable, best thing you can do with your time every single day. I think one of the reasons David was such a man after God's own heart because the scripture doesn't really tell about his daily routine, what he did so much every day, but this, look at all the Psalms and look at all the, cry, the crying out in prayer that he did and the songs he made. He was taking a lot of time in that. And that's what we know David for. One of the things we know him for. And it touched the heart of God. What are we doing to do that? Only God can help you succeed. Only the touch of God can help you in where you're at. Now, it's kind of provocative for a believer because you can't work the world's way. You're not in the world. So you don't have the luxury, so to speak, of doing things the way they do. Hook and crook and sin and debauchery and corruption. You can't do that as a believer. You've been taken out of that world and you can't go back to it unless you want to go to hell. You can't walk, walk back on the Lord. So now you're in a you're in a funny position. It's a good position, as I'm saying. It's actually the best position because if you're saved, there's nothing better than that. But there's some cost to that. You can't just do things the way the world does them. So you gotta, you have to figure out in God, me in God, with God, how are we going to get all of this done? And the Lord says, look at the life of David. Look at the life of Solomon. Look at the life of Abraham. Yeah. Paratala. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Divine ideas are going to flow. Divine revelation. And Lord, break. I see like a, like a membrane, like a smoke screen, like an oppression, like a, a filter that keeps people from the reality of the word. I don't know what causes that. If it's just lack of understanding, lack of teaching, lack of training, or uh, a void of the anointing, or it's, or it's demonic. I don't know. All the, anything that caused it, whatever the source of it is, I break it right now in Jesus' name off of you. That you read, you'll read from the pages of the Bible. Like I just took this thing here and I read that scripture. He's helped for me. And I put it like this and I said, now, that's for me. I, I, I claim that. To me, it's real. You know, I read it and I believe it to take the word literally and say that's mine. Mark eleven twenty four again, as I always so fondly talk about. Whatever things you, you believe, you're desiring when you're praying, when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. So guess what? The day, it doesn't matter how much the delay or the denial seems to be. The day has to come when you're going to really have them. Why? Because you believed for it. And a lot of other people didn't believe for things. That's why they don't have them. Another thing, you can't compare yourself with others to say, uh, they didn't have this or it didn't work for them, so what about me? No, you gotta, you got to separate yourself from that. Guess what? I'll say this 
very uh, rambunctiously. I am not like everybody else. I'm different. It's obvious in a lot of ways. But I am different. I don't have the lot of other people. I don't have the, the suffering of other people. I don't have the, the scenarios that things that keep them down and mess them up. I don't have those because I don't accept them. I'm not like everybody else. Choose that in yourself and don't be ashamed of it. And don't care. The best thing is when you get to the point you don't care. That takes a minute, by the way, but the day will come when you're so caught up in the ways of God, you just don't, you don't care. Do I look like I care? I talk like I, I even speak like I don't. It's just like, this is how it is, you know. This is life. I have life and that more abundantly, according to John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, life and that more abundantly, the abundant life, in Jesus' name. Did David have the abundant life? Yes. Did Solomon have the abundant life? Yes. Did Abraham have it? Did Job have it? Yes. And Thomas Manton has it too. How about you? In Jesus' name. All right, I'll leave it there. You can partner with the ministry. If you're tithing, sowing, offering, the links are there in the headings of the message and you can uh, become a partner of the ministry and sow your seed based on how the Holy Spirit is telling you and always obey him and you'll be blessed. Anytime you give anything, it's, you're doing a transaction with God for yourself. You're just touching the grace of the anointing to even make it happen more powerfully. And I'll say this by the Holy Ghost. This is the day where we're going to enjoy our harvest. Real, tangible wealth. Real, tangible prosperity. Are you ready for it? Who are my anchors in the faith and role models? Mr. Reverend David King and Mr. Reverend... Solomon King. That's for me too. The Lord says, take a hold of it. A poor preacher who doesn't have anything has a great voice and a gifted mind, but they don't have any, you know, substance in their life. How could you go from here to there? By taking heed according to the word. David said in the 119th Psalm, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? The Psalm 119, your word, your word, your word. Psalm 19, verses uh, 99, I think it's 99 and 100, says a student should go even further than the teacher. The precepts of, of your, your principles and your laws and dictates. Lord, I love them. And God said, you're a man after my own heart. Guess what? I'll make you a billionaire and I'll make your son a trillionaire. How's that? <laughs> Someone said, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're looking at a man like that, right here. Me. Take a hold of it. In Jesus' name. Are you happy? Are you blessed? Yes. Have you learned something? Are you good? Take it. Make it your prayer. Say, Father, like you bless David. Let me be like him. You can't just ask lazily for the prayer of the blessing like, and you didn't do anything. Start to look at what he did, how he was, how he carried on, and do it yourself. Look at Solomon. He built his whole. You'd think he was doing nothing. Look at the, the empire that he built. How did he do that? By revelation and by putting his hand to it. And, oh, Lord, yes, okay, I'll do it. Very simple basis for this as a foundation. You have to know by divine revelation to you exactly what God wants you to do, be and to have. Where, what he wants you to do, where he wants you to do it, with who, why of course you should know, and when, which is usually now. <laughs> yesterday, today, or tomorrow, whichever comes first, which is yesterday. So the when and the, the, when and the why is usually pretty covered. But the what, the where, and with who? Oh, my God. You got to know exactly what it is. And, and I pray right now, Father, I decree, you're going to give total clarity to your sons and daughters about exactly what their best gift is. 
See, some people are very gifted in a lot of things and they have a lot of options. You have to narrow it down and say, what's the one thing that I can do? Even the Psalmist David said in the scripture, this one thing I do, there's a message on that, this one thing I do, this one thing I do. He kept saying this one thing, though he could have been doing a thousand things. He said, this one thing I do. So make, let's make that your homework assignment. Ask the Lord to show you exactly what it is you should be prioritizing right now in your daily life, in Jesus' name. And let's all live like our fathers lived before us, because it's the will of God that we do. To follow after Jesus, Paul said, follow me as I follow him. Solomon followed after David, and look at the result. From the good side of it, it was very good. And we could do that too. So let, Lord, let the words fly off these pages in the spirit and just enter our minds and hearts and let us partake of that divine experience in Jesus' name. I'm Thomas Martin IV. I'll talk to you later. Love you much. Be blessed. Write to me. You're sowing your seed. You can uh, use the links in the headings of the titles of the messages to do that, and I will talk to you on the next one. Be blessed in Jesus' mighty name.